I'll tell you about one of my PhD projects, which focuses on bifidobacteria and how they control utilization of human neocolitis current. First, a very brief introduction to bifidobacteria. So as many of you probably know, bifidobacteria are part of the human gut microbiota, and they are especially predominant in the gut of breastfed children. And overall, multiple different species colonize the human gut, but today I'm going to focus on this one species called Bifidobacterium longum suspicious infantis, or simply the infantis. This uh, bacterium is very interesting because it is a champion utilizer of uh, various milk glycans, including human milk glycans, and because of that, it is so predominant and prevalent in certain populations of healthy breastfed children. And Bifidobacterium is widely considered a beneficial bacterium, and that's why it's used as a probiotic in order to repair these underdeveloped microbiota in uh, children suffering from severe acute malnutrition. In addition to this probiotic supplementation, another therapeutic approach is using of glycans uh, called prebiotics. So these glycans are not utilized by our body, but can be selectively utilized by bifidobacteria, and specifically by B. infantis. And among the most promising prebiotics to stimulate the growth of B. infantis are human milk oligosaccharides. And today I'm going to focus on these two species called lacto n LNT, and lacto neo LNT. So these two oligosaccharides are composed of glucose, galactose, and N-silucose amine or glucanac, and they can be utilized by B. infantis. And because of that, uh, the molecular mechanisms of how B. infantis utilizes these oligosaccharides have been studied before. Basically, what this bacterium does, it transports uh, LNT and LNNT into the cell and then uses enzymes called glycosid hydrolases to step-by-step -step, uh, release monosaccharides. And then the release monosaccharides are processed via downstream catabolic pathways uh, to fructose 6 phosphate. This pathway, however, has some gaps in knowledge, and one of the biggest ones, in my opinion, is transcriptional regulation, basically how this pathway is controlled. And that was the main question we tried to answer in this project. So how did we study transcriptional regulation? Uh, fortunately, we had a really good foundation for that because previously different research groups looked at what genes are, are upregulated when you grow B. infantis or LNT and LNNT. And here I'm showing you the data obtained in David Seller's lab at UMass. Basically, they found that both LNT and LNNT to the same extent, induce the expression of glucanac catabolism genes, and also genes encoding transporters for LNT and LNT. And overall, this data tell, tell us that there is some kind of global regulatory mechanism present in being fantasy. But unfortunately, the expression data alone doesn't give you information, any information about the nature of this regulatory mechanism. And that's why I used the bioinformatic approach to study that. What I did. I looked at the promoter region of this NACB gene, which was upregulated. But more precisely, I looked at the homologous promoter regions from several bifidobacteria. And there I was able to identify this concert palindromic sequences. Why it's interesting? It's because such sequences in bacteria often function as binding sites or operators of transcription factors. So my hypothesis was that this is a binding site of some transcription factor. The next question is, for which transcription factor? And here I utilize genomic context. The thing is, this NAGB gene is co-localized with another gene called NAGAR, which encodes for a putative transcription factor from the rock family. So my hypothesis was that NAGAR controls the expression of the NAGB gene. And additional piece of information here, you can see that this position of this predicted NAGAR binding site indicates that NAGAR is a putative transcription repressor because it kind of occludes the transcription star site in the minus 10 box. Next, I performed a genome-wide search for similar sequences in promoter regions of every gene in the genome of B. infantis, and I was able to find several additional predicted NAGAR operators, not only in this uh, NAGB promoter, but also in promoter regions of genes encoding for transporters for LNT and LNNT. And I was very happy when I saw this because this reconstruction was consistent with previously published transcriptomic data. But this is only a hypothesis. The good thing about it can be tested experimentally. In order to test that, one of the rational ways is just let's knock out the gene encoding Nagar and see what happens. Uh, unfortunately, genetic manipulation in Bishop bacteria is not easy. But fortunately, we have collaborators at Kyoto University, the Kanaka Tayama's lab, who are experts in genetic manipulation in Bishop bacteria. So Aruta and Miki, they created this insertion Nagar knockout mutant. And I did the RNA-seq analysis of the wild type and the mutant grown on lactose. 
and you see here you can see the results. Basically, you can see that most genes that were predict predicted to be controlled by Nagar are indeed upregulated in the mutant, which tells us that Nagar indeed is a transcriptional repressor of LNT and LNT utilization in being factors. Another, another question that I had in mind, remember all these predicted Nagar operators, but does Nagar actually bind to them? In order to answer this question, I expressed a recombinant Nagar and used this assay for testing for protein, protein DNA interactions called EMSA or JetShift. So the idea of this assay is very straightforward. You just mix your recombinant protein together with a probe which contains a predicted operator. And then you uh, separate the results of the reaction on a non denaturing gel. And if you see so-called shift, that means there is interaction because the molecular weight of the complex is higher. That means it migrates slower. And then I just tested several predicted Nagar binding sites, and I was able to show that Nagar indeed binds all of them and does not bind the negative control, which suggests that this bioinformatic approach to discovery of different binding sites of transcription factors, it indeed works. And finally, an important piece of data is in the identifying the transcriptional effector molecules of Nagar. As you probably remember, in bacteria, repressors, they can interact with these small molecules, and this interaction often can cause uh, the derepression of the control genes. So basically, these small molecules, they disrupt the protein DNA interaction. And I was able to find that using the same assay that metabolites of glucanac, specifically glucanac itself, glucanac 6-phosphate and glucanac 1-phosphate, they disrupt this upper band, which corresponds to the protein DNA complex, which means these metabolites are potential Nagar factors. And here I just want to summarize the data that I showed you before. So basically what they think is happening is when bean fantasy utilizes LNT and LNNT, glucanac is released in the process, and this glucanac interacts with the Nagar operator complex, it disrupts it, and this causes a derepression of Nagar controlled genes including genes encoding various transporters for HMOs. And one of the implications from this model is that actually degradation of any glycan inside the bean fantasy cell, which contains glucanac, will induce the expression of nagar control genes. And this basically tells us that, at, at least at the level of transcriptional regulation, bean fantasy is adapted to utilizing mixtures of uh, new glycans. And this is, an, this is an, another piece of evidence suggesting that we should use mixtures of milk glycans as uh, prebiotics instead of individual uh, oligosaccharides. And finally, I just want to briefly talk about the evolution of this Nagar regular. So the idea for studying the evolution was the following. In Binfantis, Nagar is a global regulator. It controls around 30 genes. And by bacterial standards, that's actually a lot. And that gave me the idea that this uh, regulatory system must have had evolved from something simple. In order to study that, I did the reconstruction of Nagar regul regulons in 25 uh, bifidobacterium genomes and also some close relatives. And these genomes represent strains isolated from various uh, hosts and habitats. And on the left, you can see the phylogenetic tree. On the right, you can see the reconstructed Nagar regulons. And without going into too much detail, I just want to say that the main trend is that during evolution of bifibacteria, Nagar started to control more and more genes. And to kind of summarize this uh, model that uh, we propose, so we speculate that in ancestral bifibacteria, Nagar was a local regulator of glucanac metabolism. But then when bifibacteria started colonizing uh, various hosts, including mammalian hosts, they acquired genes involved in catabolism of glucanac containing host glycans. And Nagar started to control these genes. And the pinnacle of Nagar regulon expansion can be found in bifibacteria isolated the, from the human neonatal gut, such as B. infantis and B. bifidum, where Nagar became a global regulator of HMO utilization. And this potentially can be connected with the complexity of uh, human glycans. Specifically, there are many, many different uh, glycans found in human milk that contain glucanac. And with that, I just want to finish by saying that uh, if you're interested in more details, uh, this project is available as a print on Biarchive. And I want to thank everybody who was involved in this project, and specifically uh, people from whom I learned various techniques that I used, and especially our collaborators from Katayama's lab at Kyoto University, because without them, this project wouldn't be possible to the extent I presented you today. And thank you very much for your attention.